Well, good evening, everyone. I'll go ahead and uh, get us started. I'm Kelly Testy, the Dean of the University of Washington School of Law, and it's a great pleasure for me tonight to have the honor to introduce Professor Dan Foote. In some ways, the person may be here at the University of Washington who needs very little introduction, but it's nonetheless a, a great honor to welcome him and to introduce him for his, uh, his talk tonight. Uh, the lecture that Professor Foote is giving tonight is part of our celebration of 50 years of history of our Asian Law Center, um, the oldest Asian Law Center in the, in the country and a uh, uh, center that we are incredibly proud of, all the many accomplishments that, uh, that it has seen over the years. As bright as that history has been and as distinguished, we're also incredibly committed to making the future of that center one that's even more distinguished. And, we have uh, been hard at work over the last few years making decisions about what that future will look like as the, um, the way that a, a school approaches an Asian Law Center continues to change as the configuration of, uh, of the, the areas of emphasis that we have continues to evolve. So we're really proud now that as much as that center in many ways began with a, a strong, if not a sole emphasis upon Japan, uh, while retaining that, we've also broadened our emphasis uh, to include China and also Korea and other areas within Asia. And the University of Washington is fast becoming, I think, the place that's known as the crossroads uh, of Asia in many ways, so that it, persons who are interested in studying uh, many of the you know, different laws of all those countries can see us as a connector in that regard, and we're very excited and, and proud of that. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Foote tonight because he's had such a formative and important role in the development of the Asian Law Center. Uh, he is now a tenured professor at the University of Tokyo. Uh, what many of you in the room know, and uh, I'm happy to share, is that he also spent a good part of his career at the University of Washington, uh, I think 12 years here as a professor. And during that time, he was the Dan Fenno Henderson Professor of Law and uh, incredibly important faculty member in our Asian Law Center with Professor um, uh, leading or building on the legacy that Professor Henderson established as well as Professors uh, uh, Haley um, and, uh, and others who have been so important to that center's uh, development. I want to uh, just share briefly with you that one of the plans for the future that we're incredibly excited about is that it's become possible again to think about a joint appointment between a U.S. law school and a law school in Japan. And so this visit of Professor Foote, we aim to be one of the um, times when we can celebrate not only him being here at this point, but also the start of a routine sharing of the wonderful talent that Dan Foote has so that we can have a joint uh, relationship again and, and have you back in the in the fold and I know that you're also as pleased about that as I am I see people starting to hold back applause and let's not hold back let's <laughs> let's say how how happy we are about that <laughs> um, I don't want to take up too much of your airtime today I know that people are, are familiar with your biography and it's easy to find but I do just want to say that we're so pleased that you're here and look so forward to that future uh, Professor Foote is uh, one of uh, the world's most distinguished scholars in Japanese law and also in comparative law. Uh, he, at the current time, has primary responsibility in the field of sociology of law, but his research interests have been quite wide-ranging, including criminal law, uh, law and sociology, uh, work in labor and employment, work in dispute resolution. Uh, the range of his work is very impressive to me. And I uh, also note that the, uh, the quality of his research, the quality of his teaching, and I know when he was a colleague here, the quality of his services at the institution was quite remarkable. So Professor Foote, we're very pleased that you're here with us and we welcome your remarks tonight. Uh, well, I am uh, very pleased to be here uh, as uh, well, Dean Testis, uh, noted the oldest uh, Asian law center in the US. She didn't add the word best, and I think she should have. Uh, I really do. Uh, the University of Washington is the best Asian law center uh, in the United States. Uh, I'll get to the next slide. Uh, it is, uh, I, my, including my, my 12 years on the faculty here, but since I moved to the University of Tokyo in 2000, I've taught one course every year, uh, uh, joint 
jointly with the University of Washington international contract negotiation uh, using video conference facilities. So uh, in that context, I've been an affiliate professor for the past 12 and a half years. So I, I can claim uh, that of the 50 years, I've been directly affiliated uh, with this, uh, this uh, Asian Law Center for half of it. Uh, but uh, even before uh, that uh, started, uh, certainly I was deeply influenced by the work of uh, Dan Henderson, uh, John Haley, uh, and, and the many others uh, who've uh, uh, contributed so much to this center. Uh, and I might also uh, add, uh, really one of, one of the proudest days of my life uh, was the day I was named the inaugural Dan Fenno Henderson uh, Professor of East Asian Legal Studies here. Uh, and one of my great uh, regrets in leaving for uh, University of, of Tokyo was that I would no longer be able to sign my name that way uh, after I left. Uh, but um, uh, today I am planning to speak about a criminal justice uh, and in particular the Saibain system. This is, uh, I envision a book uh, on uh, criminal justice reform in historical perspective. Uh, and I'm going to subject you to a bit of the historical perspective at the start here because I think it is important uh, to know where Japan has come uh, and to uh, give some sense of the importance of the recent reforms. Uh, some of you uh, heard a talk I gave a couple of days ago about uh, legal education reforms uh, in Japan. I've been most uh, heavily involved in those reforms uh, and uh, I'm afraid at this point I find it a rather depressing topic. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the reforms in criminal justice I, I, I count myself as an optimist with regard to these reforms, uh, but uh, I think the impact of the reforms has been even better uh, than, than I might have uh, imagined. Uh, and so today I hope will be a, a much more uh, upbeat talk. Uh, but first, the historical perspective, uh, the, the, the phases I'm planning uh, to deal with are the ones I've set out here. Uh, first, looking at kind of the historical background, the, the Edo uh, period, uh, the uh, traditional uh, Japanese criminal justice system, uh, then a series of reforms in the Meiji and Taisho era, uh, late 1800s uh, through the first part of the 1900s, heavily based on continental uh, models, uh, German and French models. Uh, part of uh, the, uh, the pre-war, there was a jury system heavily based on the Anglo-American model. Uh, and so the, the Saibain system, as, as you know, is, the, is frequently called the Japanese-style jury system. It's a lay participation system. It's not the first time in Japan. Uh, there was a, a jury system, and I want to talk a bit about uh, the pre-war system. Uh, then the next major phase, uh, heavily uh, US-influenced post-war reforms to criminal justice. Uh, and uh, really what got me most directly started on criminal justice in Japan uh, was the next, uh, the, the death penalty retrial cases. And there were four celebrated or uh, highly uh, publicized uh, cases in which death row inmates who'd spent their entire adult lives on death row uh, ultimately achieved uh, retrials and were acquitted. And that led to a lot of soul searching and many proposals for reform. Uh, and uh, then uh, the, the, the most latest, the, the recent reforms, especially uh, from 2001 on, are the, the phases I have in mind and some of the recurring themes. One is the role of confessions, the centrality of confessions uh, in a criminal, uh, Japanese criminal justice in particular. A second a recurrent theme is deference to authority and especially the central role played by prosecutors uh, in the system. Uh, and tied with that is the adversary system, various efforts in, in various reform efforts to strengthen the adversary uh, system. Uh, and a part, part of that as well was the notion of the public trials, strengthening uh, the public trials as, as another recurrent theme. Popular participation only appears from time to time, uh, the jury system, pre-war jury system uh, in particular. A couple of other elements, uh, that, uh, themes that I think are important. One is the basic uh, philosophy with regard to punishment. Uh, and especially in, in recent years, the role of victims, the uh, victims' rights movement has become an important theme. Uh, and looking back uh, very uh, quickly, um, first the, the traditional. Uh, traditional system, confession was required. Uh, in principle, there could be no conviction without a confession. Uh, it was a confession statement, uh, so-called, that was a, a prepared, a document prepared by the investigators and then sealed or uh, acknowledged uh, by, uh, by the suspect. Uh, and because confession was required, if you couldn't get a confession, then there was a 
very elaborate hierarchy and very uh, very detailed hierarchy of, of tortures, uh, escalating tortures to be used. Uh, but uh, in the in the system, again, a great uh, deference given to the uh, investigators, and there was uh, effectively no uh, formal legal profession, uh, and uh, at least in theory, and no representation at all. There were a few uh, equivalents, but. Um, uh, trials weren't open, and the punishment philosophy was harsh uh, and very much deterrence-centered, heads on pikes uh, and things of that sort. Uh, uh, the um, uh, punishment philosophy, there was a major change uh, in uh, the uh, late Meiji, early Taisho era, uh, and I've uh, cited in this regard a, a, a statement uh, or a, a presentation, a speech made by uh, then Prosecutor General Hiranuma uh, to, uh, to prosecutors, in, in which he said, basically, you know, imprisonment just hardens criminals. Uh, imprisonment, uh, we, we should be doing our very best to keep, uh, 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 keep offenders out of prison. Uh, we should be doing our best to channel them back into society. Uh, and the so-called suspension of prosecution doctrine, uh, we recognize that, in fact, we could prove guilt, we could achieve a conviction but that would not serve the, uh, the interests of society, uh, so we'll suspend prosecution and, and uh, push for reintegration. These are themes that I developed in an article uh, that I wrote, uh, published back in 1992. I labeled the benevolence uh, side uh, of Japanese uh, criminal justice, and by benevolence I, I really meant uh, use of uh, both relatively lenient sentences, but with a heavy focus on, uh, on reintegration into society. Uh, the paternalism side. The paternalism side goes to most of the other themes that I mentioned. <laughs> Deference to authority. It was paternalistic uh, by the prosecutors. Uh, the, uh, and uh, the, uh, the Meiji Taisho reforms uh, here, the continental-based reforms, on paper, they uh, affected many of the matters, uh, themes I just mentioned. Confessions weren't required. Torture is prohibited. The right to counsel is recognized. Public trials are instituted. Uh, in practice, however, uh, confessions remain central, and there were all sorts of devices for getting around, including outright torture, but it was uh, uh, limits on the number of days of, of confinement, uh, but you could get around it just by moving from police station to police station, uh, for example. Uh, and uh, the uh, counsel role was highly limited. You did have a right to counsel if you could pay for counsel. However, uh, counsel were not permitted to uh, participate in the investigation. Uh, they, they did get the dossier that was compiled by the investigators, uh, but otherwise no independent investigation uh, by, uh, uh, by uh, the defense counsel. And the public trial basically uh, was documentary. Uh, the confession statements, again, were prepared by uh, prosecutors or their assistants, uh, not verbatim. Uh, they're introduced into court, not read aloud in court, and simply passed across. So the, although it was public in theory, uh, in practice, even if you attended, uh, you'd basically just see a passing uh, back and forth of documents. Uh, the um, uh, pre-war uh, jury system. Uh, this system, uh, it was uh, uh, the Jury Act of 1923 uh, set it into motion, but there was a five-year preparation period. Uh, it started in 1928. It was very much uh, based on the Anglo-American model. Uh, with a, uh, you could, defendants could opt out uh, of the system and instead choose uh, a bench trial, a uh, 12-member jury with no judge present, uh, etc. Uh, the initial projection, uh, and again, uh, the jury decided guilt, only uh, the judge would decide the sentence. The initial projection was that there would be 2,600 cases per year. Uh, in fact, when it started, trials were quite active. There was cross-examination, uh, uh, and uh, it seems the trials were, uh, were active. Uh, and the press coverage was very positive at the start. And in fact, the acquittal rate, uh, when you compare to uh, the, uh, the, the comparable years, uh, the acquittal rate overall was 16.7%, uh, vastly higher uh, than uh, in the judge trials uh, those years. Uh, but the jury was not used very much at all. Uh, the highest it ever reached was 133 cases in a year. That was the first year. In the 15 years it was in effect, under 500 cases. Projection had been 2,600 cases per year. So in 15 years they got less than 20% of what they had projected for just one year. 
Why were there so few? Uh, various reasons are given. Uh, the kokuminsei, so-called, a Japanese uh, character. Japanese just aren't uh, accustomed to uh, deliberation uh, in a group, uh, for example. Or Japanese uh, so much trust uh, Jap uh, judges that they uh, want a, a decision by the judges. Uh, in fact, there were cost elements. Uh, if, you, uh, if you were convicted, you were responsible for paying the costs of the jury. Uh, there were many uh, barriers. Uh, you, there was, uh, for example, a right to appeal, uh, and the, uh, on appeal, the judges could uh, simply disregard, uh, or, or in fact, the judge could override the jury, uh, or on appeal, uh, the judges could, uh, uh, even if acquitted, uh, judges could uh, reverse and uh, convict. But I think, uh, but I can't prove it, but I think one of the other elements was defense counsel. It didn't pay all that well. It's a lot more burden. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, there's at least a sense that defense counsel were suggesting, you don't really want to do this, do you? Uh, wouldn't you prefer a trial by, by judge? Uh, in any event, it was very little used and was, quote, suspended uh, in 1943, uh, but it was never reinstated. Uh, the post-war, uh, post-war era here, it's a U.S. style of reforms, and in fact, uh, the U.S. occupation was quite positive about the pre-war system on paper said, well, yes, it's a continental system, but there are all sorts of uh, uh, protections uh, in, in the system. However, they were undermined by loopholes and legal fictions. We're not going to let that happen. We'll have elaborate safeguards in our system uh, to make sure that doesn't happen again. Uh, and among the reforms, uh, going to uh, confessions, uh, a right to silence uh, with various warning requirements about the right to silence. Uh, and I'll just highlight the uh, one at the very bottom here. Uh, in the uh, Criminal uh, Procedure Code, confession as to which there is doubt that it was not made uh, voluntarily shall not be admitted into evidence. Uh, and others, if it was after prolonged arrest or detention, it shall not be admitted uh, into evidence. Uh, others, uh, there was a, a strengthened role uh, for defense counsel, uh, and this was very much envisioned that they would uh, conduct their own independent investigations a heightened uh, uh, right to cross-examination. Uh, public trial was envisioned as the centerpiece, so strict limits on use of hearsay evidence, uh, for example. Uh, the, um, the, the occupation considered reinstating the jury, uh, and many Americans who were involved in the occupation said, of course Japan needs a jury. Uh, but those who were more directly involved, Alfred Opler, who headed the Courts and Law Division, uh, was a German a jurist, of uh, uh, Jewish uh, descent, uh, and um, uh, had been a, an administrative law judge in Germany. And he didn't really think much of the jury system. Uh, and uh, uh, I understand Tom Blakemore, uh, who uh, was uh, also uh, his assistant. Tom Blakemore did, wasn't uh, really fond of the jury system either. Uh, so uh, it, the, uh, it turns out that uh, the jury system was not insisted on uh, in, in the reforms. Uh, in practice, uh, very quickly, numerous loopholes and le uh, legal fictions uh, developed, uh, and they were at least tacitly accepted, and in some cases uh, explicitly endorsed by the courts. Uh, with regard to uh, the confessions, uh, I'll just highlight one uh, first a couple of elements on the uh, interrogation. Uh, the the uh, basic uh, procedure in Japan provides for 23 days from the time of arrest to the time at which prosecutors uh, must either decide uh, whether to indict uh, or release. Uh, and that 23 days uh, can, and uh, at least in difficult cases, uh, frequently is uh, used uh, for interrogations, uh, sometimes a very lengthy interrogations for each day during that period. If 23 days aren't enough, then you can get around it. Uh, Voluntary accompaniment, so-called. Uh, uh, we won't arrest you. Surely you want to come in and talk uh, voluntarily. Uh, or arresting on a second crime, or a third crime, or a fourth crime. Uh, and you may recall that uh, after prolonged arrest or detention, uh, confessions made after prolonged arrest or detention are not admitted into evidence. The court said in one case, well, it has been six months, but it was six months subject to a series of lawful, uh, lawful arrests. Uh, and just accumulation of periods on about uh, 20 different crimes. Uh, and uh, therefore, we cannot say that this was prolonged arrest or detention uh, and the confession uh, is admitted. Uh, the, um, and these were conducted uh, in, in secret, of course. Uh, counsel is, uh, pros prosecutors certainly will not allow uh, counsel to be present. 
uh, and no taping. Uh, and again, this is a confession statement. It's not verbatim, but it's prepared by the investigators. Uh, the defense counsel role, uh, similarly, uh, while the reforms called for publicly provided counsel for indigent uh, indigents, it was at the stage at which you are accused. That's at the indictment stage. That's after all the, the 23 days or the six months uh, uh, if, uh, if you've been uh, uh, subject to uh, arrest on several other uh, charges that takes place. Uh, and uh, while there's an immediate privilege of counsel, it may be conditioned uh, on the needs of the investigation. Uh, and prosecutors were not at all shy about using this. They said, we're interrogating. Uh, you can't come in. Uh, this is our period for interrogation. So in fact, uh, the uh, meetings were very sharply limited. Uh, and while in the pre-war uh, years, uh, defense counsel had been, been given access to the dossier, uh, prosecutors at this stage said, oh no, now we have the adversary system. You're responsible for conducting your own independent investigation. You don't get access to that anymore. Uh, and uh, discovery as well, the discovery system was not uh, instituted. Uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, defense counsel ended up with very uh, limited tools. Uh, and thus uh, leading in practice uh, in, in Japanese, various phrases about uh, the defense counsel system, but the cooperative system, or the quasi-adversary system, the so-called adversary system, uh, and this is borne out by a survey of lawyers. Have you ever, in your entire career, uh, requested an order compelling uh, disclosure of evidence? 75% said never. Uh, and you can go down the list. Uh, basically, a very, uh, uh, very limited uh, role for, uh, for defense counsel. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, the public trial uh, here, uh, it was largely the so-called Cho Cho Saiban trial by documents, passing across of confession statements. Uh, and again, these are, not, these are not read aloud in court. Uh, about a year or so ago, I had uh, received a message from Don Clark, whom many of you may remember, my former colleague here, a uh, Chinese law specialist. And he said he uh, was asking about Chinese uh, criminal procedure said in China, uh, there is this process of preparing confession statements, not verbatim, just confession statements. And all they do, uh, they admit they, they uh, uh, submit them to the court, and they read them aloud. Uh, but that's, uh, that's all. <laughs> and he said, in, in China, they say, and by the way, this is very similar to practice in Japan. And he wrote me and he said, is that true? And I wrote back and said, well, that sounds so much better than Japan. Uh, in Japan, they don't even read them aloud in court. And, and, and recently, in fact, there was a case in which uh, it, it turns out to have been someone who had conducted a psychiatric examination uh, of, of the accused and had access to the confession statement. And he leaked it to a reporter, and this got uh, published in a book. Uh, he's been prosecuted for violating his confidentiality uh, duties. Uh, so it's, uh, it's regarded that these are really secret documents and not to be uh, revealed to the public. Um, so much in my view for public trials. But uh, in any event, uh, that, so those were uh, some of the aspects of, of the post-war reforms uh, and the way in which they had been uh, limited. Uh, so uh, uh, a former, at the time, he was about to retire, uh, but a, a judge, Ishimatsu, uh, made a few waves by saying, we judges, uh, the courts really aren't, uh, aren't involved in this process. It's the prosecutors. It's prosecutorial justice and, and proceedings in open court are merely uh, formal ceremony. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, one more element before we get to the reform, uh, recent reforms, uh, and that's the, the death penalty retrial cases. Uh, I spent a, a good chunk of uh, several years while I was here uh, working uh, on these, these cases. Uh, the, um, and as it turns out, uh, on the, once uh, the Supreme Court opened the door uh, to retrials, there had been very, very uh, strict limits on obtaining retrials. Uh, but once they opened the door, uh, uh, retrials were held. Uh, and uh, ultimately, uh, the suspects, the defendants, were uh, acquitted. Uh, and uh, uh, the courts uh, said, in effect, you really were innocent uh, in, in at least three of those four cases. The other certainly could not be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, but among the factors uh, were that there were unnatural confessions, but prosecutors had proceeded on, or police or prosecutors had proceeded on hunches and kept changing, uh, getting new confession statements that fit the new evidence as it came in. 
uh, and su suppression of uh, exculpatory evidence uh, and other improprieties. And the reaction, this really did lead to tremendous soul searching uh, and, and really, legit, I, I think, uh, quite, uh, uh, quite real soul searching by all three so-called branches of the legal profession, the judges, the prosecutors, uh, and defense counsel, uh, and resulted in all sorts of proposals uh, along uh, many of the themes that I've, I've mentioned uh, on how this can be prevented in the future. Uh, and I'll, I'll skip over the specific uh, reforms uh, but what happened? Ultimately, here again, it was essentially just internal. Uh, each of the three branches pledged themselves to recommit their efforts to make sure this never happened again. Uh, and there was a lot of blame for defense counsel, too. Uh, defense counsel who, uh, in one of the, the first case, the, the Menda case, uh, just jumped to the conclusion that, of course, uh, the uh, suspect was, uh, was guilty. Uh, and. Um, uh, and basically said, well, please have sympathy on him. He just made a mistake. Uh, and, uh, and so it's uh, uh, the, uh, so there was a fair amount of blame to go around. Uh, but, uh, but ultimately, uh, the upshot was essentially uh, just uh, internal, uh, internal changes uh, with very little in the way of external checks. Uh, one shift, though, uh, the, uh, the courts. Uh, at least with regard to immediate the privilege, immediate privilege of meetings with counsel, uh, they became much more critical uh, of prosecutor uh, practices of allowing only 15 minutes every five days, for example, uh, and urged a greater uh, opportunity for meetings, and that led to some changes in guidelines, but uh, still, still sharp limits. Uh, and the Bar Association itself, on a voluntary, essentially pro bono basis, uh, provided so-called duty solicitor uh, system an opportunity to have one free consultation with a lawyer uh, for indigent uh, suspects. Uh, the death penalty, uh, the abolition movement also uh, took, uh, developed a great uh, momentum at that point. But as I say here, uh, the Sarin, uh, the, the Tokyo subway, uh, Sarin gas attack, uh, in the wake of that, suddenly the abolition movement uh, basically dissipated. Uh, the, um, but two other things, uh, three other, I guess, uh, uh, items I want to highlight in this regard. S a couple of noteworthy reactions. And uh, first was by uh, Professor uh, Hirano at the University of Tokyo, a leading criminal law and criminal procedure uh, specialist. Uh, and uh, he gained quite a lot of attention, uh, as you might imagine, uh, by this article, uh, which he starts off by saying, Japan's code of criminal procedure is abnormal, even diseased, and goes on to explain why it's diseased. Uh, and among the things he said is this, uh, uh, judges, uh, judges also really don't think much of trials. They think uh, the truth won't come out in a public setting. Uh, they think the way to get at the truth is to read through these, in the dossier, uh, in fact, the confession statements. In, in many cases, these go to hundreds, thousands of pages, even in some cases. Uh, the way to get at the truth is to go through the dossier uh, back in private. Uh, and he says, but the judges are deluding themselves if they think they can, uh, they can figure out the truth from that because, uh, well. Um, and, but he closes it by saying, is there any way out? Maybe not unless a lay participation or jury system is adopted. If not, criminal trials in Japan are really quite hopeless. And that's the, the final, uh, final phrases. But he is suggesting lay participation uh, or jury system as a, a way out. And one other, uh, in, re in response to Hirano, uh, uh, Professor Inoue, Inoue Masashito of the University of Tokyo, uh, who incidentally was a visiting scholar here uh, in the uh, early 1990s, um, and later served as a member of the Justice uh, System Reform Council uh, and chaired the uh, advisory committees that came up with the proposals of the Saibanyin system. But this was his response to Hirano. Uh, he said, uh, Inoue uh, said, in my view, the real crisis uh, in Japanese uh, criminal justice lies in the fact that defense counsel have so few tools at their disposal. Uh, because they have so few tools at their disposal, uh, skilled, uh, skilled defense counsel lose the will, uh, or skilled lawyers lose the will to participate in, in criminal matters, uh, that's really something we should address. Uh, and that, to my mind, is, is an important uh, part of, of the picture of the, of the later Saibanyin system. Uh, and one other uh, noteworthy development, and that's uh, Chief Justice Yaguchi. Um, 
uh, in, in 1988, he sent uh, some judges uh, to the United States and Europe uh, to investigate the jury and lay participation systems. Uh, in fact, our, our law school was one of their first stops uh, uh, for a couple of, of those who were, uh, came to the States. It wasn't entirely clear what uh, he had in mind, whether he wanted them to, one who came here said, no, it's, it's tough, I don't know what answer he wants. I don't know whether he wants me to praise the jury system or trash the jury system. Turns out this guy trashed the jury system, and I think that was the wrong answer. He, uh, uh, but um, but it, um, in any event, Yaguchi, he's later recounted, he was on an airplane coming to the States and happened to have a conversation with a woman, an American woman in the seat next to him. She talked about the jury system, learned he was a judge, talked about the jury system. And he was fascinated, fascinated by how important it was. Uh, uh, in any event, um, uh, that too, at least laid the groundwork. It opened the possibility. Uh, and I, I will skip over this, but another major uh, trend, a major theme that I, I do need to, to take into account is uh, the rise in the victims' rights movement and a punitive, uh, in increase in punitiveness uh, in Japan uh, from the 1990s on. Um, but, uh, okay, so uh, I think you no need to revisit this. Uh, it's uh, basically the same themes I've been mentioning. Uh, so, uh, but the lessons from history. There were several waves of reform, and in each of these waves, or most of them, many of the same recurring themes. Um, and I'm sure those who are involved in the reforms would say, oh yes, it made some real difference. Uh, but looking back, uh, at least my assessment is, relatively modest impact uh, of each of the prior uh, waves. Is there any reason to think uh, that this time uh, will be different? Uh, and that uh, takes me, finally, uh, to these uh, recent reforms. Uh, and uh, here, the, the real uh, mover uh, was the Justice System Reform Council. Uh, it uh, was a, a council established uh, by, uh, by the Japanese Diet uh, for a two-year term uh, and issued its uh, recommendations in 2001. There were 13 members, of whom three were uh, from the legal professions, uh, and uh, three more were legal academics with the others coming from outside, either legal academia uh, or, or the profession. Uh, and in fact, it's a huge uh, set of recommendations. It extends to many, many fields of law. And one of the other uh, striking aspects is how rapidly many of them were implemented. Uh, for me, I would followed Japanese law uh, for uh, a few decades, up to the, at least since the, the late 70s up till that point. And my sense of Japan was gradualism. Very gradual change was the norm in most fields. Uh, but that, he, the, this uh, really led to some striking uh, changes and, and quite uh, dramatic. Uh, and in part uh, because uh, uh, Prime Minister Koizumi took it under his wing, uh, pushed for a reform, uh, designated the cabinet as the headquarters, uh, and it set concrete timelines uh, and uh, uh, with uh, 2004 as the, the ultimate deadline. Uh, and as I said here, uh, there are over 20 major pieces of legislation, many other smaller pieces of legislation, regulations, things that didn't require legislative action. Uh, so really a huge set of changes. Uh, and within the criminal justice system, there were three major facets. Uh, one was a strengthened adversary system. One were efforts to invigorate trials. Uh, and the third is the popular participation uh, or uh, so-called jury system, side by system. Uh, the, um, and uh, the implementation process, the expert consultation committee uh, for uh, these matters, uh, this was chaired by Professor Inoue, whom I just referred to, uh, the one who back uh, in the 1990s had said the real dilemma is a uh, real crisis, uh, is that defense counsel don't have uh, enough tools and they lose the will uh, for representation. Uh, and, um, but turning specifically to the Saibanyun system and popular participation, uh, there was a fierce battle. First, a fierce battle at the Justice, well, fierce battle dating back to at least the 1980s, uh, but at the Justice System Reform Council itself, uh, some bitter opposition to any popular participation. Uh, and initially, the Judiciary and Ministry of Justice were uh, opposed. Uh, the, um, another view, the other extreme, was the only thing that we'll do is a true jury system. Uh, in Japan, a 99.7% uh, conviction rate. Judges, the presumption of innocence doesn't mean anything. Judges are uh, so inured uh, to, uh, uh, are so inclined uh, to uh, convict. 
The only way to overcome that is to have a true jury with no judges present, otherwise judges will dominate. Uh, a third view was quite the opposite. We should have lay participation, but we need judges involved. Uh, if you leave it to lay people themselves, they won't know anything, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, still another view was, well, we don't really care. We want some form of lay participation. Uh, and uh, in fact, the Saibain word, uh, another uh, a former professor of mine coined that word. Uh, and he coined it, Saiban means trial, in means person, basically, member. Uh, and he coined it uh, to avoid either jury uh, or sanshin, which was the, uh, the, the uh, lay participation uh, term that had been used, basically to leave it vague uh, so that uh, it wouldn't decide one way or the other. Uh, but once it was decided that there would be some form of lay participation and it would not be a pure jury, then the next issue is what proportion? Uh, and one proposal was uh, that the ju judiciary said, well, three to one or three to two, uh, three professional judges, two uh, outsiders. Uh, of course, the bar was just the opposite. One professional judge, 11 uh, lay jurors, uh, that's the French system, uh, uh, et cetera. And uh, so that was part of the debate as well. Uh, when the, the rationales, when the judiciary did give in and say, okay, we can have uh, such a system, uh, the, um, uh, the rationales it offered was, <laughs> basically, we've got a great system, uh, but this will make it even better. Uh, and it'll make it better because the people will understand the system better, they'll have more trust in the system, and maybe we can use some additional uh, views, maybe that will also help uh, 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 given an even richer uh, discussion. Uh, the, the Bar Association was quite different. Uh, the Bar Association, part of it was proper penalty. We need to have popular views to ensure a proper penalty, but much more emphasis was put on miscarriages of justice, presumption of innocence. Uh, we need uh, outside views uh, to overcome the tendency of judges to just convict everyone. Uh, and, um, but it will also help achieve popular sovereignty and will also protect uh, uh, human rights and, and freedoms. Uh, so a long, very long uh, range of, of think goals that uh, the bar had for it. Uh, it was, well, I guess all proposals typically are pro products of compromise, but here it was really quite extreme, a whole series of views that came together uh, in it. And, and one of the other sets of views was the judges are out of touch with the common sense of society. They're too lenient. Uh, don't they realize uh, victims, uh, the, the concerns of victims? Uh, and, um, but yet another uh, was the way it ties into the other elements. Uh, and Professor Inoue, uh, good friend and, and, and colleague, uh, uh, but uh, explained to me at some point, said you have to look at the justice system reforms uh, proposed by the Reform Council as really three legs. Uh, it's a, a three-legged structure uh, it's um, the, the popular participation system, but various steps to invigorate the adversary system and other steps to invigorate trials. And they're all interconnected. It's the jury system that holds them all together. They'd all been proposed in the past, uh, or other, but, um, but it, with the jury system, uh, in order to have the jury system function effectively, you would need a trial where the jurors can listen, uh, and here they don't have to read thousands of pages of dossier or hundreds of pages of dossier. Uh, uh, and so you need a trial that's uh, at the center. Uh, but beyond that, in order to really have an invigorated trial, you need a strong defense counsel system. Uh, and to achieve a strong defense counsel system, you need various other uh, steps, uh, such as uh, providing point, uh, court of, uh, government provided counsel uh, from the suspect stage and expanding the discovery system. Uh, so these, uh, that's yet one other uh, aspect uh, of the reforms. Uh, the, uh, the system itself, uh, it was uh, again a five-year preparation period uh, as uh, with the Taisho era a jury. Uh, this time uh, it's also criminal trials only, uh, initially limited uh, to serious cases. Uh, early predictions were for about 3,600 uh, cases per year, but it's mandatory. There's no right to opt out. Uh, and that was part of the lesson from Taisho. If you let, let uh, defendants opt out, uh, they, might, they might not use the jury at all. Uh, the, um, 
And uh, it's also mandatory even if it's a, not a contested case. Uh, this is uh, not mandatory only for contested cases, it's mandatory for all cases uh, in the, the covered categories. Uh, the, uh, it's a, a, a nine-member panel, six lay judges and three professional judges. Uh, for uncontested cases, the law would permit a five-member uh, uh, panel, uh, but so far it's only the nine-member panel has been used. Uh, and they de uh, deliberate on both guilt and sentence. Uh, and so far, at least, it's a blended procedure, and this is one of the issues that's under consideration. Should it be bifurcated? Should there be a, a decision first on guilt uh, and then later on sentence? Uh, I certainly think so, uh, but at least so far, it's a blended procedure. Uh, one other, a couple of other elements. Uh, judges in Japan may question the witness and may question defendants. Uh, judges give a perfunctory warning at the start or notice you don't have any duty to, uh, to, uh, to uh, make a statement, uh, but then uh, very frequently say, so, would you like to say something? Uh, what's here? Uh, the, uh, uh, but uh, here, uh, again, the lay judges also have the right to ask uh, questions. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, one other uh, feature, uh, as with, uh, uh, as with uh, cases heard by judges, acquittals may be appealed. Uh, and uh, so, but here, if it's appealed, it goes to the high court, and the high court is composed only of professional judges. Uh, and so this is the mock-up. Uh, there was a lot of deliberation, a lot of uh, discussion given to how it should be framed, who should sit where, uh, but ultimately the three professional judges are at the center, presiding judge at the very center, uh, the uh, lay judges on either wing, uh, and I have said here an additional reform was the closing of the defendant. Up till that point, uh, defendants came in typically in prison garb, uh, and um, uh, one of the members of the Citizens Council for uh, Japan Federation of Bar Associations, on which I sit, uh, strongly protested, said that already sends the message uh, that you're guilty, and it did. Uh, and, uh, and that was another reform. Uh, now defendants are allowed to wear uh, normal clothes. Uh, the, um, uh, prior to implementation, kind of ironic, uh, the mass media in the past was highly critical of prosecutors and uh, uh, the dominance uh, by prosecutors. But as soon as the system was uh, uh, basically announced, uh, then it shifted to uh, saibain bashing uh, and bashing at uh, many levels. Uh, but among the, uh, among the concerns, one was reluctance by the public to serve uh, and or fear. Will jurors be able to play? Will they jurors be able to play a meaningful role? Won't they be dominated by uh, judges in the Japanese context? Uh, the, um, uh, and here, various surveys, uh, cabinet uh, conducted surveys, uh, and members of the public said, you know, I don't have any confidence I'll be able to do this. I don't know anything about how trials are conducted. I don't know anything about law. Uh, uh, some other uh, concerns. Uh, were a confidentiality requirements. And there are some, uh, according to the law, if you read the law, it looks as though very strict uh, confidentiality requirements, uh, which uh, literally, you can't even talk to your spouse uh, about, uh, about the trial. Uh, and uh, other concerns over pretrial publicity, uh, for example. Uh, and certainly a major concern, preparedness. Uh, the judges and prosecutors were able to set aside time for training uh, for it. Uh, most uh, defense counsel were not, most lawyers were not, uh, so that was another uh, concern. Uh, and the rea reaction by the public in general was, why? You tell us it's for us, it's for popular participation. You never asked us. This is top down. Uh, uh, and um, the initial uh, response, uh, first uh, survey in 2005 when asked, do you want to participate, etc. Uh, only 4.4% said they wanted to participate, uh, and uh, over 70% said either I don't want to, I don't really want to, don't much want to. Uh, next time around, they learned their lesson. Uh, they changed the phrasing. So they included this other, I don't really want to, but I will if it's my duty. Uh, and so that suddenly uh, gave them a much higher uh, percentage. Uh, but even 2009, and this was, survey was conducted just as the new system was starting, uh, uh, but even at that point, wanting to participate, it was up to almost 14, per, well, over 13%. Uh, but uh, still, 26% said, even if it's a duty, uh, I won't go. Uh, so uh, this is not really a, a ringing endorsement by the public. Uh, the, um, 
But other reforms, so this is one set of reforms, and there were, uh, were other uh, reforms, as, I, as I've mentioned. Uh, the other uh, two legs uh, to strengthen the adversary system, uh, access to counsel is, uh, is increased, uh, counsel from the uh, suspect stage, uh, great expansions in legal aid, uh, and also the judiciary uh, gets involved in uh, uh, sending a stronger message about the importance about having access, either immediate access to counsel or at least very early uh, access to counsel. Uh, the uh, uh, discovery system is also uh, substantial increases uh, in discovery, right to discovery. Uh, still some limits, uh, actually quite uh, uh, many limits, but nonetheless major expansion. And again, the judiciary sending a message. And this was a Supreme Court uh, decision involving whether a confession was voluntary or not. And if you looked only at the official prosecutorial records, everything looked uh, voluntary. But the Supreme Court said, to really get at this, we need to know what, what went on in the interrogation. Uh, and police who sat in on the interrogation, they were taking handwritten memos, and they ordered disclosure uh, of those uh, handwritten memos. Uh, that sent shockwaves through the police. Uh, one of the uh, a police officials was taken by class at the time. Uh, but uh, it did send a strong message on the importance of, uh, of disclosure. Uh, and uh, also various steps to invigorate trials, but, and in particular uh, to achieve uh, what in Japan is called directness and orality, meaning live in-court testimony, direct in-court oral testimony uh, rather than simply uh, passing documents uh, across. Uh, the, um, finally, has it achieved its goals? Uh, and again, there are many different goals, uh, but with regard to presumption of innocence, well, uh, the acquittal rate uh, for these uh, cases is, uh, uh, for, for the first three years, 0.6%. It's basically the same as the same categories of cases uh, in prior years. But there have been some very striking acquittals. And I've highlighted here, in eight cases involving drug smuggling, uh, juries acquitted. And these are cases in which the drug smuggler said, well, you know, I was at the airport in Lagos, and uh, so uh, somebody came up to me and said, I have this package that I'd like you to take. It's to deliver to somebody. I had no idea there were any drugs in it. Uh, I just accepted it uh, and, and came in. And wow, I'm shocked to, to discover that it's full of heroin. Uh, the, um, uh, and in any of these cases, there have been acquittals. And in Japan, it's basically unthinkable that professional judges would have acquitted in these cases. Uh, and uh, so at least, uh, at least in these cases, uh, the presumption of innocence uh, with a jury uh, really willing to uh, consider that that, you know, that might have happened to me. I, I, could be, uh, I could be gullible. I could have uh, uh, done it. Um, and uh, so those are one, uh, one set of striking cases. Uh, another that I found very striking was uh, there was a DNA match uh, for the suspect, uh, but nonetheless, uh, after a searching review of circumstantial evidence, uh, the, uh, and this was a, a death penalty case, uh, but the, the court uh, acquitted. Uh, and this too is at least conceivable. One likes to think that uh, you didn't need uh, Saibain uh, to uh, achieve an acquittal in this case. Uh, but uh, these are at least some striking uh, examples uh, of where uh, the, the Saibain uh, seems to have been undertaking a really searching review. Uh, it's too early to tell whether this is protecting against uh, mistaken uh, convictions. Uh, my, my, uh, my response to that would be that more important than who is the decision maker itself are the other attendant reforms, uh, the reforms to access to counsel, discovery, uh, and the like. Uh, and uh, at least one can hope that those uh, will play uh, some role in protecting against mistaken convictions. But Ten years from now, who knows? We may uh, we have yet another uh, set of, of mistaken convictions coming to light. Um, have they affected sentencing? Uh, and if so, in, in what direction? And one view was uh, they're too lenient, uh, and we need the common sense of society. Uh, uh, and in sex-related crimes, rape and sex-related crimes, there has been a significant increase in sentences. Uh, for other categories, uh, the median's about the same as it was, but there's much greater variability. Judges tended to be uh, very much along the same so by the same uh, uh, market rate, uh, whereas uh, with the now the Saibain trials, 
uh, there are more uh, cases at the lower end and, more ca and, a, and a few more cases at the higher end uh, of the spectrum. Uh, for me, the rehabilitation, reintegration uh, ethos is a very important element of, of Japanese criminal justice, and I, uh, I have watched the, the growing punitiveness uh, and, and feared that the Saibayin system might have a, a negative impact on it. At least so far, that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, if anything, uh, there is a increased use of suspended sentences, but much greater increases in suspended, se suspended sentences with supervision supervision by a probation officer. And here, uh, it seemed that it, in the past, there was basically an acceptance by everyone involved in the system. It doesn't really work. Uh, probation officers, they're old. They can't relate to these uh, young uh, offenders. Uh, they've got too high a caseload, etc. cetera. Uh, so we just won't uh, put, place any expectations in it. Saibayin are placing expectations in it. Uh, and uh, I, I think there is a message here. We want to have reintegration into society, and we think the probation officer has an important role to play in it. Uh, it may be that uh, two or three years from now this will all backfire. Uh, uh, it may be that this will also send a message, we need to re-examine the probation officer system. Uh, and if there are problems with it, uh, get younger probation officers, get more probation officers, and the like. Uh, so at least in that, in that regard, I, I view this as a sense that the Saibayin are really placing expectations for a reintegration. Uh, has it enriched deliberations or uh, conversely uh, the fears that Saibayin will be dominated by judges uh, and won't be able to express their own opinions? Uh, here at the conclusion of every trial, the, the court uh, distributes a questionnaire to the Saibayin and asks them to fill it out, and the vast majority do, in fact, uh, fill it out. One of the questions is, uh, was it easy to talk? In the deliberations, did you find uh, that there was an atmosphere that made it easy to talk? Uh, and here, uh, the Saibayin say overwhelmingly yes, uh, well over 70% say yes, it was easy to talk, uh, and a very small percentage say it was not easy to talk. Were you able to discuss thoroughly is another question they ask. Uh, and here again, uh, over 70% say, uh, yes, uh, it was. Uh, we were able to discuss uh, thoroughly. Uh, about 7% here uh, respond that there was insufficient uh, time, et cetera. Um, and, uh, but uh, again, uh, very high uh, ratings for uh, ability to talk and, and uh, thoroughness of discussions. Uh, the, um, whether this is strengthened popular sovereignty or not is another uh, question. Uh, the, uh, and very hard to get at. Very hard to get at in part because access uh, to uh, those who've experienced the system is very limited. Um, there is the Jury and Democracy Project. If, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's a, a project that uh, at least started here at the University of Washington. The two, uh, two faculty members involved in it, uh, John Gaspel and Cindy Simmons, uh, have been lured away by Penn State. Uh, but it's a great project uh, and very, uh, very thorough, uh, comprehensive empirical study. Uh, I'd love to be able to do such a study uh, in Japan, uh, but, and I actually have, have a group of people translating the book in part in hopes that it will persuade the Japanese judiciary to give us permission to do something similar. Uh, but at least so far, it's very hard to get at it. Uh, the, uh, at least by one token, uh, the ability to discuss on an equal footing uh, with, uh, with professional judges uh, may give those who participated even greater uh, confidence. Uh, but uh, again, the strict limits on confidentiality make it hard to get uh, uh, to have much spillover uh, impact. Uh, and there are relatively few participants. Uh, can they understand the proceedings? Well, maybe I'll. Uh, well, overall, yes, they say uh, they're mm -hmm. easy to understand. Uh, but the one category here, defense counsel, uh, they don't do so well. Uh, it's. Um, Particularly in denial cases, uh, only 28% of the Saibani said they were easy to understand, and about 25% said it was hard to understand. Defense counsels say, well, that's just inevitable. Uh, our role is much more difficult than the prosecutor's role. We're trying to plant doubts, uh, uh, et cetera. Of course, it will be much more difficult to understand. But this does at least raise some, uh, some questions about whether uh, defense counsel, uh, are, are both preparedness and, and ability to connect uh, with the jurors. Um, the, um, and uh, how have they evaluated their experiences? Again, those who've served prior to serving, over half said, no, I didn't really want to serve. 
Uh, but after serving, it's overwhelmingly positive. Uh, 55%, and these are consistent year after, uh, through each of the first three years, 55% have said uh, it was an extremely good experience, 40, another 40% have said it was a good experience. Uh, but this doesn't really mean there's no longer reluctance to serve. Uh, and these, these figures are, are troubling. Uh, it's uh, uh, nearly 60% to seek and are given a waiver uh, when, they're, uh, when they're called. But even if they're not given a waiver, despite Japanese uh, feelings of duty, uh, over 20% uh, don't appear uh, even, uh, even after receiving uh, the summons. Uh, so there are uh, concerns in that regard. Uh, skip over those. I just want to end uh, with uh, some comments about the impact on the judiciary. And this, uh, to me, I, I find uh, especially heartening. Uh, and although Chief Justice Yaguchi had expressed fascination with the system, there was great resistance within the judiciary, rank and file judges and even uh, high level uh, judges. Uh, there was great resistance. Uh, and the judiciary easily could have undermined the system in many ways. They could have uh, at least dominated the process. Uh, um, but looking back over the five year preparation period and now the first three and a half years of the system, I am very impressed uh, at, the, 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 at the great efforts the judiciary has made. Uh, and not only to get the system off to a good start, but by its focus on the ideals. Uh, really seeking to achieve live in-court testimony. At one point early on, someone said, well, maybe the judges will just get these dossiers and these chosho, and we'll have to prepare our own short summary, because we, surely we can't expect the Saibangin to read all of them. But instead, they said, no, no, that's not the direction to go. We're going to focus on live in-court testimony. Uh, and they've also devoted great efforts to ensure that Saibangin can participate actively. So they do let the Saibangin speak first and put a lot of effort into training judges so that they will facilitate discussion uh, rather than squelch or stifle a discussion. Uh, so tremendous efforts during the, the five-year preparation period uh, and since then as well. Uh, when the question of constitutionality came up, the Supreme Court dealt with it very quickly, a unanimous uh, decision by the entire 15-member court uh, saying basically uh, there's just nothing to this. Uh, it is uh, clearly a constitutional uh, system. Uh, and uh, when a high court reversed one of these drug acquittal cases, uh, the Supreme Court overturned that as well and said, uh, you really should respect the findings, uh, findings of fact by the, the, the first instance trial. After all, they saw the people, uh, they saw the, the witnesses in their live testimony. Uh, and in fact, there has been some backsliding by both prosecutors and defense counsel. I want to go back to the old uh, docu uh, document, uh, documentary trials. That's a lot easier. Uh, and uh, the judiciary is pushing them uh, to uh, keep to the, uh, the live in court testimony. Uh, they've also been uh, proactive uh, with regard to other reforms. They've pushed for greater cooperation on discovery. I mentioned the earlier Supreme Court uh, decision uh, on uh, police uh, memos uh, so, uh, and other uh, decisions relating to, to discovery. Now there have been a number of decisions rejecting confessions on voluntariness grounds, which passed very, very seldom happen. If the courts were going to reject a confession, they do it on reliability grounds, but not voluntary, uh, voluntariness grounds. Uh, and uh, there is now a major push for videotaping of interrogations, great resistance by the Ministry of Justice to it, and kind of grudging, well, maybe the very final stage after we've done our 23 days of questioning uh, will uh, the, uh, uh, but, um, uh, but now there is a, a real push for uh, meaningful uh, videotaping of the entire process. If that happens uh, and these videotapes start to come out, I think there'll be some real shockwaves about what goes on behind closed doors. Uh, but in any event, uh, this, uh, this at least also ties in uh, uh, to uh, the, uh, the advent of the Saibanyin system. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, some major changes in attitude by the judiciary. Uh, before it uh, started, uh, I was told by our judges in Japan are divided typically into those who handle criminal cases and those who handle civil cases. Criminal cases in the past, there's been almost no interaction with the public. Civil cases, there are settlement conferences and the like, so much more interaction with, uh, with members of the public. Uh, and the judiciary uh, was suggesting that some of the judges who handled civil trials might shift over uh, and use that experience for the criminal trials. I'm told there was resistance. We don't want to do that. We're civil judges. We don't, uh, but uh, 
recently, uh, I've had meetings with, with judges, uh, and uh, told that within the judiciary, now they welcome the Saibanian tribes. They really want to handle them. These are a popular uh, appointment. Uh, it's a chance to uh, have some real interaction and to develop a, a new set of skills. Uh, and, um, and I will uh, want to close here with a quote uh, from former Chief Justice Shimada. I haven't written it out. Um, but it's about, uh, and, and this is a comment that I've heard as well from uh, several defense counsel and several prosecutors, uh, that the advent of this system has really given us the opportunity to rethink or to reflect on what the basic uh, fundamental meaning and significance is of criminal trials. Uh, and the quote uh, from uh, uh, former Chief Justice Shimada, uh, from uh, judges who've handled the Saibanin trials, uh, I've heard uh, the sentiments that by forming impressions in open court through concentrated hearings centered on questioning of, of witnesses, they have rediscovered what the true nature of criminal, criminal trials should be. And at the same time, they've come to the self-realization that in the past, they were apt to fall into the rut of doing things in the same routine fashion. Or where concepts such as self-defense, intent, or criminal responsibility were at issue, and where in, in the past the judges had applied the concepts in accordance with standards from academic theories uh, or judicial precedents they'd input into their brains just like stereotyped formula. It's been highly educational to have to return to first principles and reconsider the true meaning of the concepts in order to explain them clearly to lay judges in the context of concrete cases. Or by coming into contact with the keen questions or innovative views raised by lay judges, they feel as though their eyes have been opened to new ways of seeing things. And to the extent that this continues, uh, this really suggests a very, very great change in attitudes of judges uh, and uh, suggests, uh, to my mind, a much broader impact uh, of the side buying system uh, beyond uh, simply the, the relatively narrow range of cases uh, that is uh, uh, being heard by them. Uh, and in many ways, I think represents a, a watershed uh, event uh, for the development uh, of uh, criminal justice and potentially uh, civil justice as well. Uh, and with that, I will close. We'll say to Arinato. I will, of course, be very happy to take some questions. I see that I've already gone three minutes beyond uh, my appointed time, but uh, uh, I'm here for as long as anyone has questions. Yes. Yes, it, the, the, the victims' rights movement, I've, I've skipped over that here, uh, and it really does introduce a, a very uh, a sort of a parallel theme. Uh, it's not directly tied into the Justice System Reform Council. Mm -hmm. Behind the scenes, uh, there, there are some uh, intimate or some comments uh, in the re recommendations about uh, concerns over whether judges really understand the uh, feelings of, of society, uh, but uh, simply raised as this is something that has been said. We, of course, the Reform Council aren't aren't saying this, but uh, uh, but uh, the the victim. So the, in that sense, the victims' rights movement plays comes in very little into those recommendations. But there is a separate. Uh, the victims' rights movement really starts to take uh, take on steam in the 1990s. Uh, and a number of, of uh, uh, highly uh, 
uh, both uh, controversial cases, but also with lenient sentences. And uh, uh, another was the dump truck, uh, dump truck driver uh, who ran over a, a small child and s seemed to show no remorse whatsoever and uh, received a slap on the wrist. Uh, and uh, energized a victim's rights movement and very much a punitive oriented victim's rights movement. Uh, and uh, the victim's rights movement, uh, I guess part of my view of the victim, <laughs> one, of, one, of the, one of the aspects is uh, Japan has never paid any attention to victims in the past. And that, uh, at least if anyone has read John Haley's writings on the role of apology uh, and uh, remorse in the Japanese context, uh, certainly will will realize that these, there has been a considerable attention to the views of victims, uh, but not as a formal matter. This is really as, a, as an informal matter rather than a formal set of rights. Uh, first set of uh, 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 law, uh, first major law relating to a victim's rights was uh, essentially the right to make a statement, a uh, victim impact statement uh, uh, type uh, reform. Uh, in the Japanese context, uh, typically given uh, orally uh, at the close of, of trial. Uh, but uh, th more recently, uh, the victims' rights movement has gone far beyond that to uh, grant a right for victims to, ha to be represented themselves, to raise questions, to pose questions that they want the prosecutors to ask. If the re prosecutors refuse to ask them, then to have their own counsel who will basically play the role of prosecutor uh, and ask questions, uh, and also to give a closing statement on why they feel uh, greater punishment is warranted, uh, for example. Uh, so a, a right to directly participate in the proceedings uh, as well. Uh, and uh, so it has, um, this is a r rather major set uh, of, uh, uh, of rights uh, for uh, victims uh, in Japan. But it really has gone along a kind of separate parallel, separate tracks. Uh, and but it does tie into the punitiveness, uh, and at least uh, in the uh, early uh, sort of 2000 through uh, 2005 or so, substantial increases both uh, uh, legislatively in penalties for a broad range of crimes, uh, but also in sentences that were being uh, uh, levied, uh, and in use of the death penalty. Uh, so there is uh, a growing uh, sense of, of punitiveness in, in that sense as well, which parallels the victims' rights movement and may or may not be directly uh, related to it. Yes? Uh, It, uh, you, there are a couple of different organizations, one the Saibain Kensha Network and the other, uh, what's it called, Lay Judges Something Council. Uh, and I was on a, a panel with one of the members of this, uh, this lay, uh, lay Judge uh, Council, who's been I think, the most prominent uh, member of it. Uh, actually, he is, he is very much the, the rehabilitation, reintegration uh, aspect as well. Uh, so one of his sets of recommendations is, and he's one I think who is, is frustrated that uh, there is not enough opportunity to deliberate. They want to ask more questions. They, uh, uh, and that there is a sense that by the judiciary to make it easier to serve, they want to keep the uh, deliberations as to a relatively short length. Uh, so one of the proposals is uh, let's not worry about that so much. Uh, if there are additional issues uh, rather than trying to narrow the issue so much, uh, why can't we open it up and, and let uh, uh, defense counsel and, and prosecutors really address more issues? Uh, and that, so that's one, one part. Another is that uh, lay jurors, lay judges, and he says real uh, professional judges too, uh, they must know, they should know, uh, what happens after conviction. There should be an attention to what prisons are like in Japan. There should be opportunities for lay judges to visit prisons and to see, to learn more about uh, the, the probation officer system, for example. Uh, so that's another set of recommendations. With regard to confidentiality requirements, there, there is a mix. Uh, and there are some very strict, at least on paper, confidentiality requirements. Teguchi-san, uh, who is the, kind of the leading the person who has appeared now in 
God, I think he said he's been in all, fifth, all 47 prefectures and visited. He, he's, he's given talks just all over Japan now. Uh, and his view is, leave it as is. So one of the proposals is we need more sort of concrete guidance on what's permissible and what's not permissible. And his view is, leave it as is, it's vague, there, uh, that guidance would inhibit me. But because there's no such guidance, uh, I can speak much more freely. Uh, but uh, as, um, as the moderator, as I would have said if the moderator for the uh, uh, conference I, I participated in had not said before me, well, for Taguchi-san, that's fine. Uh, he's the sort who will use that ambiguity, but for most Japanese, uh, it's, it's, they're not going to view this as, a, uh, as license to speak more freely. Uh, rather, they're likely to be inhibited. Uh, so that's another one that has not been, I think my recollection is that their recommendations don't really specify a position uh, on confidentiality. Uh, so those are at least some of the, uh, it is a long list of, of uh, proposals. I don't recall. I'm sure Taguchi-san himself uh, strongly favors it. I don't know whether that, uh, that group has taken a position or not. Okay, so uh, let us conclude the formal part of the presentation. Thank you, Professor Foote, again for this wonderful lecture.